My name is Dr. Brad Reedy. I'm the co-founder and clinical director of Evoke Therapy Programs. We started these several years ago. In fact, we'll be uh, we'll be uh, celebrating our 12th year anniversary this December from the beginning of these. What we thought we would do is that once a week we would have a broadcast that was just open question and answer um, for, for somebody to be able to check in midweek in between their therapist phone calls. It's also valuable, I think, to ask questions that people might ask of you. So if you have questions that family or, or friends are asking you, please feel to submit those questions to me. And, and also, we thought this was a, a special opportunity for siblings. Siblings uh, at times can be left behind in this process, don't feel involved in this process. So one of two things can happen. You can submit a question about a sibling, about how to deal or cope with a sibling issue, or you can ask a, a question that a sibling might ask you, and then I'll give you my answer and you can see how that feels. Try that on for size and see if it works for you. If you are an extended family member, we do invite you, Evoke Therapy uh, family families, to invite your extended family and friends to these to share the link here, because this is an opportunity for those around you to be able to understand what they can do to best support you in this process, you and your child in this process. So with that preamble, I'll get right into our pre-submitted questions for this evening. And first and foremost, I wanna thank our veterans, wish you a happy Veterans Day, and thank those of you who have served and those of you who have loved ones who have served for your service and your sacrifice to our country. We really appreciate it and we really thank you from the bottom of our hearts at Evoke. So here's the first pre-submitted question. What, what determines length of time in the program? Length of time in the program is something that evolves between you, the parent, and the Evoke therapist. If your child is a young adult, it also involves them in the process because they're here of their own free will. They can leave if they want to. And so they become more a part of the process. And and what this, this question probably is one of the oldest questions that I get asked, the one that goes back to my first days in wilderness therapy. There's no one answer or, or, or metric for this. It's not like that people arrive at a certain point and, and leave at a certain point. Everybody arrives at a different point and there are different goals. Part of it is an assessment about what is needed next. And that determining, after you determine what is needed next, that's going to impact the length of stay. And so I'm not dodging the question or punting, but I am saying it's a discussion that you can have with your evoke therapist weekly. You know, where are we in this process? For some people, this question gets asked just for pragmatic reasons, meaning that you have a job that you have to plan ahead and you would like to have maybe a graduation ceremony with your child, pick your child up from the program. If that's the case, case this is what I encourage. I encourage you to talk to your evoke therapist, tell them of that need, and then schedule a date that would be your best guess and their best guess for the right time, the right ending. Now, let's say you chose December 1st for your date. And then as December 1st approach, you set this date weeks in advance. As the December 1st approaches, for whatever reason, maybe their next setting isn't ready for them. Maybe some more information has come out. Maybe they've stalled or regressed in the process or there's a, there's a new aspect of assessment. So that December 1st date that you've already picked and bought your tickets for and, and, and told work that you're going to be up, you can still come out for that week. The difference is that the purpose of your visit now has now changed. The purpose of your visit is now um, a mid-program or towards the end of the program visit. And then you come out, you do your visit, and then maybe your child leaves um, without you the, the next week or the week after, or you can just come out and pick them up. So if it's a pragmatic need that this question comes from, you can do that. You can schedule a date for your visit, and then the, the purpose of that visit can change. So it's, it's, it's a discussion and, and a dialogue. Uh, I think most people think in terms of, you know, what's the, the benchmark for, for treatment progress, for, for objectives for my child, and that's going to be individual. There are a lot of clients and students who make a lot of progress here. There are some that make uh, less progress, but they might have less, less uh, of a journey to go. They might be higher functioning in the beginning. So it is a dialogue. It's, it's the same thing that I believe about therapy. Therapy is not something that I do to you, right? I don't believe in that. People ask me ahead of time, what, what, what are you going to say to the client? Here's the issue. What are you going to say to them? 
And my response is, I don't know what I'm going to say to them because it's going to be a dialogue, right? Therapy is something that gets created between you and the, and the therapist. And this program, in a very similar way, gets created between you and, 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 the, and the therapist. So you develop that as you go. Second pre-submitted question, what makes Evoke different from residential treatment or other wilderness programs? Okay, I think that's really two different questions. I'm going to talk about the difference between wilderness therapy and um, what we would call other levels of care, other approaches. Number one, it's it's principally experiential, right? We believe in talk therapy. Talk therapy is a part of what we do. We believe in psychoeducation. All of those are a part of Evoke. This is psychoeducation. But in addition to that, we also believe in the power of experiential therapy. We believe that the we, we know that memory and trauma is stored not necessarily in, in the verbal part of the brain. And while some people some people might not be able to access their trauma, right? What's buried beneath the symptoms, but they also might be good at, at faking good, even faking themselves out, being able to say the right thing. So experiential therapy evokes an experience. It, it, it uncovers an experience for somebody. I always say to my parents that I'm working with that I learn from your child virtually all, all that, that you're, you're telling me in the first week or two in the process because I see it. It gets exposed in the, in the peer interactions. I was just telling a story just this morning about um, one of my, my, my first clients. In fact, I wrote about this in, in my first book where um, a student was, I, I asked a student to step away from the group because he was snapping during breakfast and, and chores. And then I went over to visit with him a little while later. And, and the issue wasn't really about what was happening then. He was missing his mother who had passed away. And I remember sitting in the story that I tell in the book is I had nothing to say to him. I just realized really at a, in a profound level what therapy was. It was just being with a person in their feelings and their pain. But, but I bring this story up now because he could say the right things. But the experience of living with other people and having to deal with communication, problem-solving chores exposed the issue, right? It brought it out. So experiential therapy deals with, with trauma and resolution and resources the same way that those things are, are stored in our brains, and that is through experience. Then we anchor that experience in traditional psychotherapies, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapies, brain spotting, psychodrama, other therapies, family systems theory, and so forth. But, but we have this kind of delivery method that is incredibly provocative. The other thing that, that, that happens different in wilderness therapy from other versions of therapy is that it is provocative and powerful and dynamic, meaning that you, you get something in, in a few weeks that takes months in a traditional residential setting because of the level of intensity that happens out there in the wilderness. It's raw. It also lends itself to mindfulness, right? The, the, all the distractions, it's digital uh, uh, detox, so to speak. So you're naturally removed from your environment. The cool thing about wilderness therapy is that sleep, diet, and exercise are all naturally a part of the program. Those three things in and of themselves, even if there was no therapy, those three things in and of themselves would improve mood and stability for most clients, most people that are suffering from a mental illness. So, and, and also there, there's an opportunity to be more present with yourself because you're not distracted, even by positive things like reading a book, which most of us would associate with, with a, a positive thing for our child, but it's therapy heavy. Everything out there becomes grist for the, the therapeutic meal. So that's just a little touch on what's different from, from other forms of therapy. What makes Evoke different is number one, we're nomadic and primitive. A lot of wilderness therapy programs in the last few years have moved over to adventure therapy or recreational therapy. And while recreation is a really critical and important part of life, for a short period of time, we find this to be much more, uh, it um, facilitates the process much more powerfully. In fact, there's a great podcast that, that I listened to by uh, Adam Grant, I believe is, is the host. Um, 
and he talks about building trust in the workplace. And he, he says one of the stories that he that he shares is that NASA has its new if a team hasn't worked together, an astronaut team hasn't worked together, that they go through primitive living wilderness therapy experiences. And he said that exercises that are contrived, you get team building exercises, games that are contrived, don't bring up the same level of vulnerability and don't build the same kind of trust. And so wilderness therapy is, is, a, is a raw experience that, that, that naturally brings up vulnerability and trust. You know, one of the things that I've found to be so powerful is how much better therapists are when they become wilderness therapy, therapists and they would tell you the same thing. Evoke specifically, besides being remaining true to our, our nomadic, which means we hike around from place to place, and our primitive living, which means we're not recreational therapy, um, we have a very strong mindfulness and, and compassionate-based program, right? We, we use, we teach, we, we practice mindfulness with our clients. Also, the underpinning of our entire program is attachment theory. And I, I, I can almost simplify it this much. It's almost this simple. Attachment theory is the number one thing that tells us about, that, that shows us about a child's ability to, to develop resiliency and, and grit in the world. Attachment, providing a se secure attachment for your child is the number one predictor of a child's well-being and, and meaning, uh, having a well-lived uh, life. It's the number one predictor. And th if you want a resource for this, Read Daniel Siegel and Mary Hartzell's book, Parenting from the Inside Out. Read my book also. It's very similar. And also the other sources I have for this is every single client that I've ever worked with and every single attachment study that I've ever, ever read. So attachment theory is really foundational, providing secure attachment. So we do that with, with your, your, your child, but we also do it with you. The reason we invite you into the work so much is not because it's a blame shame game or pointing the finger, but because we're doing it because we know, and the research is exhaustive, that the more work that you do, the more capable you are of providing a secure attachment for your child. So secure attachment is the number one predictor and the number one predictor of your ability to provide secure attachment is the amount of work that you do sorting through your own history, your own life. This is important. This is kind of fascinating to me. And again, the book by Daniel Siegel and Mary Hartzell, Parenting from the Outside Out, Inside Out, is a great reference. It is not predicted by, your ability to provide this for your child is not predicted by how good your childhood was. Excuse me. You can have a relatively traumatic childhood. And if you've done a lot of work with it, you can provide secure attachment for your child. And conversely, I think more interestingly, you can have a, a pretty nice childhood. But you, if you haven't done work around it, haven't unwound it, looked at it, understood your context, be able to explain it in a deep way, deep and meaningful way, you're less capable of providing a secure attachment for your child. If you're more curious about the attachment model that I'm talking about, you can look at the podcast, listen to the podcast or Look at the webinars in our archives on attachment theory. So that's a big deal. I, I was just talking to a couple of inquiry, inquiring parents today, and I was talking about they were they were talking about other, other wilderness therapy programs, and I was explaining it's it runs through our, our our program from the bottom, from the the newest of field staff to the therapists to to the partners. One one of the things that we ask and invite and pay for for our therapists and our managers is to go do their own work to get their own therapy because we believe we know that the more again you you've made sense the more work that you do you've done the healthier employee you are the better you are at communicating the better you are at supporting other people so that for us is a big thing and that definitely stands out as unique the belief in the foundation of the work and the quality of it even these We've been doing these, like I said, for when, when I started for almost 12 years. I've done over 1,100 of these broadcasts. And that was long before. Some people now, some programs do them once a quarter, once in a while. We've done 1,100 
in 12 years because we believe that it's critical. And it doesn't, parents that get involved in this at first, they, they, they'll tell me very often that what I'm talking about doesn't make sense, but later on they'll say, it changed my life. And, and that's all parent education can do is change your life, right? Parent education doesn't change children, it changes parents. But that change in a parent can have a wonderful impact and influence on a child. So that's a little bit about evokes philosophy in our DNA. Our research outcomes are better than average also. 30% better than the industry average. Is wilderness, next question, is wilderness okay for anxious clients or could it be traumatizing? I, I get asked this question now and again. You know, being outside, um, being left with your own thoughts um, can be difficult. My One of my first teachers in the mid-90s of wilderness therapy said to me, wilderness therapy is like life, only more. And he said, it's spending time with yourself and seeing how you like the company. And so that can be difficult at times to be left with your own voice. But if you're not at peace with your own voice, then there's some work to do there. You can think about you can think about self-medicating, like with substances or or cutting or other things that are avoidant, right? Other compulsive behaviors. Essentially, I love this definition of addiction or of self-medicating. All of those behaviors are an attempt to not be present with your own life, not be present in your own life. So it, it can be difficult and, and challenging and uncomfortable for sure. But we want to be there for them, again, in a, in a very compassionate, very comprehensive way so that they're comfortable, so that they don't need to escape from their lives. And if it gets determined that after all the work that they can do, that they still need a, a, a program, for example, a 12-step program that helps people with compulsive behaviors, then we know that also. But there's a lot that we can do to make sense out of the voices in our head. Most of your children are, are medicating something, something in their head. They're trying to get rid of some voice in their head. And it's our job to hear what that voice is, what's, what is that thing they're trying to get rid of, to numb, to anesthetize, and then can we find its origin and can we do battle? At the end of our program, what I say to parents all the time, we're not going to complete therapy with your children. I don't believe in completing therapy, actually. For me, just personally. I, I've been in it for 28 years, been with my current therapist for 21 years. And for me, it's just like going to the gym. It's just a part of a, a healthy life. That's my bias. All of my children go, my wife goes, it's just our culture. But the idea is to, to set the project. Right? What's the project? for your child? What's the project for you? We're not going to reach the end of the, the, the journey, but at least you'll have a better idea about what the project is. And, and believe me, that makes all the difference in the world. I had a father at a Chicago parent meeting say to me recently, he said, you know, this has taken me years and, and it's worth it. And at first he said, I didn't understand. I didn't get it, but now I get it. And I have hope. And, and his hope is not based on, or not, not, relying completely on how his child is doing because his child has, has had up, ups and downs. But he said, I'm more grounded. I'm more stable in this process. And, and that helps me to be a better parent to my child in the process. Remember to submit questions if you have them, any live questions. Um, what do you have for siblings? Seems like they get left behind in the process. I get asked this question all the time. In fact, I was asked this question by a parent just recently in New York City this week, this last week. We try to have these. We've actually started a program for siblings before uh, because we wanted something that was kind of therapy light that would introduce them to this process. But it ended up that we ended up with people that really needed the, the, the program that we already have. So, so and then we didn't we couldn't fill it enough with siblings. And so it was a challenge for us. We would love to have programs for siblings. But unless the problem gets bad enough that they need wilderness, people aren't able to, siblings aren't willing to come. And we dealt with some pretty difficult circumstances with, with siblings in the program. So here's what we have for siblings. I know this sounds strange or a weird thing to say, but we have these for siblings. What, what you're learning now 
in dealing with a child with a mental health or addiction issue, what you're learning now is this, it's the same education for prevention. It's the same education for dealing with children with moderate issues, right? That the, what we know about treating people, families with mental health and addiction issues and the tools that we give them, it's the same tool that I would give to a family or a parent if a child had no problems. I was speaking to, um, years ago, I was speaking to parents of, of elementary school age children and they were asking me questions about really how to prevent uh, situations where their children would end up in programs like, like ours, like mine. And I was brought in for that purpose. And I explained to them, I said, it's the same work. You know, what does virtually every treatment program in the world teach parents or family members of, of people in treatment centers? What do they teach? Communication and listening. Virtually every program in the world teaches that. That also happens to be the thing that if I were teaching a brand new parent, that happens to be the same tool and the same skill. It's it's no different. It's learning to feel. So for example, if a sibling says to you, um, I'm angry that you sent my brother or sister to the program, or I don't want to talk about it, because everything was all about them and I'm angry. You learn from our process, for those of you who've been at it for a while, you learn to listen to that in a different way. And you fight the initial instinct, which is to fix it and to change their mind, right? That's most of us have that instinct with our loved ones. But the, the tool is tell me more about that. Tell me more about how you're feeling and understanding and compassionate. The minute you understand the defense, we'll call that the defense, the minute you understand the defense, it lowers. The minute you fight the defense, it raises. So you learn to listen. You learn how to set a boundary but not be right anymore. Right? You, you learn what it means to be a self. I have a podcast, a, a webinar on what it means to be a self in parenting. You learn what it means to be a self. I had a father recently write a letter to his son that was an amends letter. And after a lot of work, this father wrote this amends letter to his son. In our program, he's been here for, for a couple of months. And, and the profound thing about it is this father figured out, I'm not apologizing for my boundaries. Those are okay. But I'm apologizing for what I said as I set those boundaries, for the anger, for the, the, the shame. This summer, my 11-year-old, my parents, my, my mother comes out for 4th of July and the cousins come out, my brother comes out every year. For 20 years, they've come out to, to visit. So my 11-year-old is, is with my brother's 11-year-old and um, they're playing in the back seat. My wife is in the front seat. My mother is in the front seat. I'm not in the car. And they're pulling up to a little, we have a frozen custard place in, in Salt Lake City, which by the way, is the best tasting thing in the entire world. They're at this drive through Nelson's frozen custard on Highland Drive in, 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 in Utah. So they're pulling up to this frozen custard stand and the kids in the back seat, the two 11 year old cousins are yelling and not paying attention. And my mother turns around. My mother is not usually like this. And she turns around, she's frustrated. And she says to the cousins, she said, kids, knock it off. Michelle, that's my wife's name. Michelle has spent the entire day driving you around, trying to make this a fun day for you. And she's just asking you now, and she needs you to give, to be quiet, to quiet down and give her your order so she can give it to the person at, at the window here. So the cousins are kind of like, wow, grandma's mad. And my 11 year old paused for a few moments and she said, grandma, I have something I want to say. So my mother said, yes, what is it? My 11 year old said to her, Grandma, I think boundaries are okay, but shame is not. And then my 11-year-old said to my mother, Mom, what do you think about that? And my mother, excuse me, my wife, then tried to figure out how to dance through the politics of, of dealing with, with her mother-in-law. But it's that idea that, that we try to, to foster, which is you can have a boundary. You just don't get to be right. And shaming and intimidating children into 
Cooperative behavior might work in the short run. In fact, it can be very effective in the short run, but it comes at the cost of so much else. So I digress a little bit, but that tool works for my 11 year old and it works for my 26 year old and my 25 year old and my 17 year old. It works for me and my wife and our relationship. And it works for an employee that I have. Boundaries are okay. I can be assertive. Shame is toxic. It's dangerous. And it's tempting because it is incredibly impactful and powerful at times. So those skills, those tools, all of these broadcasts, all these webinars, my book, which your, which your wilderness therapist is going to talk about, I know it's indirect, but that's the process for siblings. And these specific webinars and podcasts, we do want to have something that talks about that. And so when you ask me questions like, when you ask me questions like, um, you know, what do I say when my, when my other child at home says this, the first thing I always say is just listen, understand and validate. The eight tools broadcast that we have, if you want, maybe our most basic if you're into tools, if you want to know what tools, our most basic tools broadcast is listen to or watch the eight tools webinar, eight tools for transforming relationships. Because, and I, and I teach this to our therapists, th this idea of not confronting the defense or attacking the defense, but honoring the defense, I don't do it because it doesn't work. I do it because it's more effective. And I'll say one last thing before I go on to the next slide. It looks like I'm getting some live questions. The number one most common presentation for resistance. In other ways, in other words, the most common way that people show up in therapy as resistant is compliance. David Grand, who who wrote the book Brain Spotting, that that some of our therapists use, that I talked about in, in a webinar recently. I love what he said. First of all, he was he was trained as an analyst, which is very similar to attachment theory. But but he said a model, in fact, brain spotting is kind of an, a, a, of an evolution of EMDR. It's a, it's a form of, of treatment for trauma. And, and David Grant said the reason, one of the reasons I moved on from EMDR and, and developed brain spotting is because any theory that does not take into account a client's wish to please the therapist is not adequate. And, and, and your children, I, I want you to know this because this is important because I've worked with clients in all types of setting. I have a handful of private clients that I carry all the time. And I will tell you that, yes, they lie and, and, and fake good and, and, uh, try to please us because they know we have leverage over how long they stay here and, and, and where they go afterwards. All of that is true. But clients also want to please their therapist when they are adults and have the therapist has no leverage over them. I have to constantly remind myself to show up honestly and authentically in my own therapy sessions. And I've been doing it for 28 years as a client. And I've been with my therapist that I have now for 21 years. And I have to work to show up authentically and honestly instead of trying to show her how much I've, I've, I've learned and how far I've grown. So yeah, it's a part of manipulation, but it's also a part of shame. I'll tell you one story before I get off this topic. One of my favorite therapists of all time, she's a writer. She wrote one of my favorite books on boundaries, The Dance of Anger, Dr. Harriet Lerner. I was at a conference recently in Houston where she was presenting. And after she presented her talk on shame, the moderator or the, the MC got up afterwards and he was going to take a couple of questions from the audience, but he had one first. So he said to Dr. Lerner after her talk on shame, he said, Dr. Lerner, Lerner, how do you deal with shame in therapy? And she paused for a moment and she said, I think you're just asking me how I do therapy. That's... That's how fundamental shame and resistance is to therapy. It's basically therapy. What, what, we, what we do as therapists is we treat resistance. And, and much of resistance is based in shame. 
It takes almost no skill, almost none, and no training to tell somebody how to live a healthy life. There's some very basic things that everybody, therapists and non-therapists would agree on. That's easy. We treat resistance. That's why self-help books aren't the same. It's one of my, my issues with, with pop psychology where they just tell you how to do it right. Th that's easy. Most of us know a lot of things. Think about whatever your, 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 your Achilles heel is. For me, it's, it's eating healthy. I, I know what eating healthy looks like. That's not hard. The, the question is, why don't I all the time? Right? I know not yelling at my children is the right thing to do. But what gets in the way? So all of this goes back to all of this is for the siblings. And I have found in my career that one hour with a parent is worth about five hours with their child. So while we don't have and can't have and haven't been successful at creating programs for siblings, some of these podcasts and webinars can be helpful directly for siblings. And some of them are helpful indirectly because they're for you. And it's the same thing for you guys. All right. Take any live questions on any topics. I have a few and I'm gonna read them to you. First question, talk to me about aftercare. What does that process look like for a young adult? How is the location determined? I'm gonna talk about young adults and adolescents. And for young adults, they get some input, right? You have some leverage, most likely, and, and you might be encouraged to use that. Like I'm willing to pay for this and I'm not willing to pay for that. But typically we 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 like to with 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 you and, and the professionals you're working with at home, we like to give them a couple of choices, ideally. So they, they, they have some ownership of it, but you narrow those choices down to a couple or a few. And then they can research them. Some of these programs might want to talk to them on the satellite phone. We definitely, with all clients, even adolescents, we take into consideration what they're asking us for. And I, you know, adolescents don't have to choose it, right? They, as you know, um, can't walk out of the program legally. So we we have ultimately that that power. You have that power over them. But even with that, I always wanted to, to hear what my adolescents said that they wanted and needed. Because even if we don't give it to them, even if we don't, we don't respond to that those requests at face value, we still learn about what's important. And sometimes with adolescents, the, the farther along adolescents are in their work and their acceptance of it, the more of a vote they get in it, right? If their attitude is, it's going to be a waste of time. I don't want to go. I'm going to sabotage it. No matter where I go, I'm going to be unhappy. Or you have to give me this, 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 and this, or else I'm going to sabotage it. Having a say in it doesn't make sense. But if their response is, I'll, I'll make it work. It's not my first choice, but I can see the value in it. And I know going home would be a risk. And if you probably gave me the choice, I would probably choose to go home. But I, I accept it. And the most important thing and determining my success at the next placement is me. When, when we start to hear those kinds of things, and we do, by the way, when the door is closed with adolescents and we're not negotiating anymore, they can move past fighting it and move to acceptance and even investment. So when they get to that place, then you become much, much more curious. And sometimes with adolescents, you'll give them a choice and you'll say, I've, I've approved these two or three programs. This is you, the parent talking. I've approved these two or three programs. You can choose. But but that has to be real. That can't be staged or fake, even with young adults. Don't say you're okay with them if you're not. And and, and don't... One thing about aftercare or, or specific aftercare, as long as you've accepted them, uh, decision A and B or maybe A, B, and C, um, don't try to sell them on it. Because you, you know how it is when there's a new movie out? I'm sure everybody's had this experience. There's a new movie out. And your expectation is off the charts. I feel that way about Star Wars, you know, the final Star Wars that's coming out, right? That's just something I've loved in my life since I was a kid. It's going to be hard for it to live up to that expectation. Other movies, on on, on the other hand, that I have low expectation or, or reasonable expectations, they can blow me away. So So be careful of trying to sell them on it. If you, if you want to talk about some positive things about the program, talk about some things you think they might not like. Just as a way to make sure that you're balanced. So that's a little bit of what, of what it looks like. 
the question is what percentage of, of, of children go home versus aftercare? Somewhere around in the high 60s to 70% for adolescents and maybe in the low 60s to high 50s for, for young adults. So averages around two thirds. I wanna tell you this, I just said this to somebody today. When I started in wilderness therapy in the mid 1990s, my bias were, was that kids should go home. It just made sense to me, maybe culturally, it made sense to me. It made sense to me because I, I saw the, the kind of progress that kids made in wilderness therapy. In fact, a, a few consultants, educational consultants, had to kind of fight with me in those early months of, of my career around this issue because it didn't it didn't resonate with me that, that, that people would go away from home or not go back home after this process. But then experience happened. And so my bias now is that many of the clients that get to this point would benefit from aftercare more so than going home. So my intuitive kind of bias was home, but my bias from experience is aftercare. Clients, students, and families, in many cases, tend to be happier and more satisfied with their process, with some level of care away from home after evoke. So, so that's where those numbers come from. Is brain spotting done with each client? Not necessarily, no. Some therapists use it and some don't. I don't use it. I, I've, I've read the book. It's, it's not my approach. But, um, but, but he does talk about, David Grant does talk about this idea that we do some of it intuitively. right? You, you pay attention to, my therapist will say to me, she doesn't use brain spotting, but she'll see me with a far off look and she'll say, where are you? Where'd you go? Or David Grant says that, in brain spotting that where one looks um, might be a, a resource spot for them, a grounding spot. And oftentimes he says that's the eyes of the therapist. So some of it, what I loved about brain spotting compared to some of the other tools, which felt much more rigid to me is some of it is intuitive in, in what we do. Last question that I have live. Why doesn't the psychiatrist play a bigger role in wilderness? Maybe meds are counter to each other in appropriate dosage. Um, well, we're a short-term program. And so um, when, you're ha when you have an intense short-term program like this, tweaking meds, um, you, you want to make sure we, we do it. We do it often. We, we titrate off meds. We change meds. We, we have our, our, our psychiatric team diagnose and, and, and implement medication, but we're just not rigid about it one way or the other. It's not like everybody needs it or nobody needs it. It's just case by case. So um, I suppose it's just the level that we feel like practically from, from experience is the right level. I, I will tell you this, anybody that has a philosophy that, that is biased towards no meds or all meds, and some psychiatrists you may know, are biased towards all meds. Psychiatrists don't get a lot of training in therapy. Most psychiatric programs, most medical schools, you take one semester of psychology. And you may have one rotation of psychiatry. Some, of course, do more because they become interested, but their solution to problems is medication. So if it's if it's if everything is one way, I'm always skeptical of it. It's it's usually both. Right? It's usually a combination. So I suppose that's the the most honest answer I can give you. Looks like there are no questions. Thank you for joining us again. Th these open forums are just for you. We'll do these once a month or so, and then the rest of them they'll be talk topic based, and then peruse per peruse our, our, our list of webinars in the parent portal uh, and look for uh, among them the hundreds of topics, and then you can also go to our podcast page. That I'll talk about. Um, I just finished the New York group. So Southern California, I'll be in Southern California. There are limited spaces available for this one. I'll be in the South Bay on December 1st from 3.30 to 6.30 p.m. So if you're in Southern California and you want to attend a meeting, um, please RSVP to Melanie at evoketherapy.com and for more information. If you want to do a deep dive in your own work, this is something I do every year. 
something my entire family's done. This is something we pay for therapists and, and, and managers to do. Um, we do it somewhere else for them. But come to our Finding You. November is full. Um, so it's too late anyway. But the next one is December 11th. And then you have the 2020 dates there. If you're curious, go to our webpage or email intensives at evoketherapy.com. It's a deep dive in your own family of origin, your own process. And the benefit that comes out of that, I cannot, I cannot tell you enough of how helpful I think it is for, for parenting. Um, if you want to find out more about our pursuits trips, which are therapy light adventure trips that are short term for families, parent, child, even siblings, that could be a sibling program. Pursuits trips, think therapy light, think reconnection, think sober fun anywhere in the world, any activity, custom design run by our staff. We ask all parents that, that, that are current to attend six 12-step support groups while their child is with, with us. Any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, you can, you can Google those and find out meetings in your area. Also, adultchildren.org is a place you can go to to learn more about. If you feel like maybe you had a toxic childhood growing up, it's a great program. I think it's underrated. Uh, Alateen is for teens. That's another program that can be for teens. RefugeRecovery.org is a Buddhist-inspired, not not an emphasis. So it's a support group, not emphasizing a higher power for for recovery for those who want a different version of recovery. And then NAMI.org is a, the National Alliance on Mental Illness that has local chapters and throughout the country and has free or affordable resources for everybody. All of these broadcasts are available on your podcast app on an iPhone or an iOS device that looks like the podcast app, on an Android device that looks like the SoundCloud app, and on, on your computer, you can go to soundcloud.com. Find us on Twitter and Instagram. Find Evoke Therapy there using the handle at Evoke Therapy. And you can also find the Summit Lodge, which is our intensive program, our therapeutic family, couples, and individual intensive program, short-term, four to six days. Um, go to Instagram, at Evoke Summit Lodge is the handle. Um, on Facebook, search evoke therapy programs to find us the alumni foundation which we're looking for more board members we're going to be closing up this search soon but if you're interested in giving back helping to raise money for people that can't afford therapy that's what this organization is for go to facebook and search evoke family foundation and then our blog has new content on our website my first book the journey of the rogue parent is available on amazon and also audible All right, it looks like that's all. I'll be doing a, later, a webinar later this week. I didn't have time to, to put up the topic, but the invite should go out in the morning, so look for that. You can also follow us. If you follow us on social media, we announce all the broadcasts coming up. So I think my broadcast is this Wednesday or Thursday. I'm not sure which day it is, but the, in, the invite will go out tomorrow morning. Thank you for joining us. I hope this is a helpful midweek point of contact for all of you. Thank you for your pre-submitted questions and your live questions. Take care, folks. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.